So I can then work on like hip activation, muscle activation, knowing that, hey, studies show that you are going to be weaker on this muscle, right? And then the idea is that how does having a weaker glute med, how does that maybe translate into a risk factor for another ankle sprain? Over pronation. Okay. So if I have a weak glute med, my femur might dive in, my ankle might over pronate. That actually takes me out of a lateral ankle sprain though. That puts me more into like maybe a medial ankle sprain because that pronates my foot. Think of, is there a reason if this is my foot, right? Here's my tibia. Is there a reason that I would weight bear more on the lateral aspect of my foot? Right, if, I, if I weight bear more on the lateral aspect, I'm going to more likely invert my foot, right? My weight bearer, right? Think about if I lean my trunk over, right? It's so like a Trendelenburg gait. If I have a weak glute med and I lean my trunk over, that shifts my center of mass where? Lateral, more outside of where it should be, meaning my weight center of mass of my foot's now a little more lateral, right? Same reason with like your ACL tears. If, I, if my trunk leans over too much, it now pushes my knee inward. My center of mass is more outside of my joint, right? For those of you that listen to this on the recorded, it's going to seem a little weird because I didn't start the recording for the first 20 minutes. <laughs> so it's just <laughs> starting. So, sorry about that, guys. When you listen to, if you listen to this, for everybody else that's not actually here today, um, you missed the first part about diagnosis and all the uh, red flags and rollout. Sorry, my fault. Okay, so yeah, so another thing to think about: uh, there are things we can do. So, so how about later on? Let's say the person said, "I sprained my ankle. It's been a month." You know, I'm kind of back to walking, doesn't really bother me that much. But you know, if I, if I step weird, if I turn, if I walk more than an hour, I kind of still get it, right? So we've done all this table stuff. What would be some other things we'd want to look at assessment-wise? Gait deviations, balance, proprioception. Good, okay. What, uh, what would be some of those gait deviations? Intelligent gait. Okay, so intelligent. Um, intelligent gait doesn't necessarily fit into a gait deviation per se, because we're saying that the reason they have deviations is because it hurts. Think of someone that no longer has pain when they walk a lot. How would they walk that's different based on their answer? But it doesn't necessarily hurt right now, but they're not walking normal. We have early heel, heel rise, decreased stance on the affected limb, Perfect. and short steps. Perfect. So all three of those could be answered by, I don't have enough talocrural mobility, right? My heel comes up early because my dorsiflexion sucks. I take a shorter step because I don't have enough dorsiflexion, right? I don't spend as much time on that leg because my, when my tibia goes forward, right, I run out of room. So I'm going to lift my leg up, right? So yeah, so I'd say we definitely want to look at gait, right? Because a lot of these people that sprain their ankle are going to get back to running and um, doing sports. And if they can't even walk normal, you're going to see these impairments become even more. So yeah, so those all come down to dorsiflexion, right? There's a great, there's a great dorsiflexion test that we like to do that can tell us, do they have enough dorsiflexion for weight bearing activities, right? And so that would be your knee to wall, right? Where you put your foot down and you can either measure your foot away, but you just try to get your knee to touch the wall. And what's normal? Here's a, a test for you guys. What's normal weight bearing dorsiflexion? 43 centimeters. Um, change the measurement from centimeters to something else. 45 degrees. Yes. 43 degrees. degrees. Yes, degrees. So, so one way to measure is 43 degrees. Another way to measure it is 10 centimeters from the wall. Your foot's 10 centimeters from the wall. So you have different measurements. But the nice thing is we want to make sure they have good weight-bearing dorsiflexion. All right, check. So that's, that's like the top of Mount Rushmore. They have the mobility in their ankle to walk normal, right? What else are we going to look at at these more subacute or chronic ankle sprains? All right, swelling's already down, right? I don't know if they answered that earlier. They probably answered that earlier. Balance proprioception, they mentioned. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Perfect. Gabriella mentioned. Perfect. Yeah, so balance. So there are some, if we go to associated impairments, right? Besides all of our mobility, our muscle activation stuff, we can look at balance assessment. 
right? And we can just do single imbalance, right? That's an easy one. 30 seconds, eyes open, eyes closed, right? You compare it to the, you have the perfect assessment, right? You compare it to the other leg, right? So you're able to see how close, how bad are they, right? Right. You also have your kind of what's called your best test. So balance error scoring system, right? And this one, it has uh, um, six different types of tests. So some are with single limb stance, some are tandem, some are um, on a pad. So there's six different scenarios and you're just counting errors, right? So actually I may play that one for you guys. Can you guys hear that? No. No. Single limb stance and it. There we go. Good. With the patient's hands on their hips. Can you hear that now? Closed, they must yes. Six different positions. A double limb stance, a single limb stance, and a tandem stance on both a firm surface as well as a foam surface. The patient needs to hold the position for 20 seconds in each place. The number of errors encountered is counted by the therapist. Errors include opening their eyes, stepping or stumbling out of the test position, removing your hands from your hips, or lifting your toes or heels. The number of errors are then counted and compared to the opposite side. So 11 to 13 errors is considered normal. So you think if you have six different conditions, right, it's normal to have errors, anything over 15, um, or anything over 13 for a younger person for ankle sprains is considered an issue, right? Nice thing is, again, you just compare it to the other side, right? So that is just like a step up from your single imbalance. So yes, you can do single imbalance. Here's like a single imbalance on steroids. And then you also have your star excursion balance test. And why do you guys think we like this one? Like, why is this one something that I would recommend all of you guys use for your ankle sprains? What do you guys think? Dynamic mobility. Okay. So it looks at dynamic mobility, right? Which Functional. Is, but there's another reason why I like to do it. And I don't, maybe I don't do it eval day one, day two, but I'm going to do it sometime in the rehab. Return the sport? Yeah. Right. As we said earlier, right, 70, up to 75% of people are going to re sprain their ankle within a two year period if they go back to basketball, right? This test looks at a risk factor for re ankle sprains. So if someone who's already had an ankle sprain, this, if they can get a certain number, right, it's like six times less likely that they're going to re-sprain it versus they don't get that number, they're six times more likely to. So, and so you would look at it in three directions, but the one that had the most correlation to ankle sprains specifically was your posterior medial. So here she's standing on her left leg, it would be the one when she reaches out to the right. So you're trying to make sure that those are pretty equivalent to each other, right side, left side. So stand on your leg, shift all your weight, and then be able to go come back to it, right? So again, so star excursion. Um, nice thing is if they don't do it well, this becomes their, their training, right? How do I make this harder? Let's say I'm training it and I'm saying, you know what? When you go back to the best of our ability, I don't want you to re-sprain your ankle. So we're going to work on this, work on this. How can I make this harder and actually use it as a training method? Bend the knee more, put them on an Aretz pod. Okay, so we can make, make it harder. Have them do it quicker. Good, do quicker. Good. What else? Eyes open, eyes closed. Good. So we've trained the stability surface by the Airx or maybe a BOSU ball, right? We can then train the proprioceptive component of it by making their eyes closed as well. So yeah, we can, we can and I think someone said go faster, go lower. <laughs> yeah. So we can also train muscle activation and stuff. We also have with perturbations, shoes on or off, you yeah. also can yell at them as if they're in a game. Yeah, you can, yeah, throw a basketball at them, throw a football at them, have them do certain things while they go along. Yeah, totally. That's fantastic. Those are great answers, guys. Good. Okay, so let's go back to our physical exam, associated impairments. We've now looked at balance, right? The next step up would be our hopping, right? What would be some of the hop tests, right, that you guys would want to look at? Noise hop test, single leg hop test. Okay. With our single leg, is there any specific direction you'd be most um, curious about? Lateral? Mm -hmm. Yep. yep. Medial lateral. Yep. Yep. 
Good. Backwards. Yeah. Good. So you think about, I think someone said noise hop test, right? Noise hop is the evidence for ankle sprains and noise hop test is not nearly as good as it is for knee and hip, right? So you think about ACLs for the knee, FAI for the hip. Um, for, uh, for Achilles, it actually has better evidence because of the power component of it for your gastroc. But when we talk about ankle sprains, it's not necessarily a power problem, right? It's more of a stability thing and it's a medial lateral stability, right? So the research for ankle sprains is more of the lateral stuff. So we have this lateral hop for distance, right? So just how far can they jump on one versus the other? So you guys threw out single limb hop, that's exactly what it is, but instead of forward, it is lateral, okay? All right, remember they always practice a couple times and then they try to stick it side hops. So here you stick, stick two pieces of tape apart from each other and have them go back and forth, back and forth. Place two lines on the floor, 30 centimeters apart. Repeat 10 jumps there and back, three practice trials, and then three real trials, which are timed measurements. The patient then compares this to the opposite side as well. Perfect. So again, we like this test because it has a, has a number, it makes it very objective, right? It's like, hey, you did this many in 10 seconds on the right, and you only did this many on the left, right? Um, or so we can count how many they do in a certain time, or we can say how long does it take you to do 10 of them, right? Later on, like so some athletes, they do a 60 second one. So you think about these people that have to play basketball or soccer, they're running, they're gonna get tired. It's can they get to like 50 hops, 60 hops in 60 seconds, right? And it's funny because the first 20, 30 look really good. And as they start to get tired, right, their explosion slows down, their upper body control slows down. So you say, oh, this is where the risk factors come in where you're now at a risk to re-sprain it. So, um, so we like that one. There's another one called your square hop test, right? Place a 40 by 40 centimeter square on the floor. Have the patient start outside the square on the involved limb, jumping into the center of the square and back out, moving in a clockwise direction. The patient performs five cycles, taking a timed measurement. If the patient is unable to... So again, so it's one full cycle is eight jumps, in and out, four sides, eight jumps. You do that five times. Let's solve the 40 jumps, right? And you're trying to get a measurement of time, right? Nice thing is compared to the other side, there's studies that show what is the, the minimal detectable change. So I do it at, let's say, one month out, and we check it again two weeks later. Have they made almost a four-second improvement? If they have, that's significant, right? So it's good. So again, it's something we can do. Some of the other ones, I won't show you all the videos. Some of the other ones they talk about doing is what's called the hopping course. And again, there's a time for it. Um, it's been studied as a risk factor to return to sport. And then you just, so you have soft surfaces, non-soft surfaces, and they just kind of jump around and do an obstacle course. Figure of eight hopping, same thing. They hop around two cones and six meter uh, crossover hop. So you're timing them on kind of like your six meter hop for your noise. This is more of a crossover and you're timing them for how fast they can do it. So what a lot of these have in common is there's a lot of lateral jumping. It's not just forward. It's a lot of lateral jumping to see how well they add stability. Right. Dr. Lemoyne, we had a good question. Absolutely. How would you address endurance rather than strength when rehabbing kind of at the tail end for a return to sport player, such as a basketball player? Um, how so, do you find that balance? So early on, they may not be able to like work out hard enough to get fatigued. Like you can't necessarily have them sprint on a treadmill maybe, but you can have them power the heck out of their arms on an arm bike or ride the heck out of a stationary bike. And I'll have them go really, really hard for a minute sprint and then go stand on your air X. So right now all the blood's pumping all over, they're fatigued, they're breathing hard. So their balance is going to be off already, right? No different than a concussion patient, right? Everything is stimulated. Everything's fine. So their balance is going to be a lot harder because their system's working on being out of breath. So nice thing is you can do that very early on when they're not able to do maybe high level lower extremity stuff, right? So I'd say I do that a lot, especially for the people that really want to work out and they're like, oh, I want to go run. I want to go run. But man, you still have two centimeters of swelling and you lack 10 degrees of dorsiflexion. It's probably not smart for you to go run, right? However, you can ride the heck out of that bike, right? Don't get off the bike till you move that stationary bike forward one foot, right? Um, so, it's, it's, so that's how I would say you can train the endurance component. That kind of answer the question, whoever asked that? Yeah. I believe so. And then from a strength component, are you um, 
are you just continuing? Like, how do you, how would you balance that as well? Are you, are you doing other exercises around that to address the strength or is it kind of, um, are you doing both in one section, uh, in one session? I would say unless they have a strength deficit, okay. I'm not. They've, cause okay. studies show that the, they've split groups up where one group gets a balance and proprioception and the other group gets strengthening, right? Typical strengthening, whether it's machines and calf raises and the, all the peroneal bands. And they did do the group that had just uh, air X training and hop training had significantly less ankle sprains, right? So we think of it, it's not, people don't sprain their ankle because they're weak, right? Now, if they're weak, that can be a risk factor. So make sure they're strong. But the reason they sprain their ankle is because initially because of a trauma, but the reason why it happens again and again is because you lose the ability to tell where everything is in space quickly, right? If I moved everyone's ankle far enough, you would all be able to tell, oh yeah, that's inverting. But if I only move it a little bit, or my body weight shifts over a little bit, my ankle turns a little bit, your muscles should pull it back very fast, right? Before you even know it, it's almost like a reflex, right? Every time we walk, your muscles are activating to kind of pull everything aligned up. Um, your ligament helps stabilize that after an ankle sprain, after five ankle sprains, that ligament's probably not doing much anymore. So now it's all about your muscle speed and control. So when I land, do I have good stability? If I'm on an uneven surface, do I have good stability? So I'd say not that I want to neglect strength, but it's not a focus of mine unless, unless they show a true detriment. So I'd say that would be maybe the person that was in a boot for three weeks because of a really bad ankle sprain and their calf atrophied. I'm going to work on calf raises. Um, the person that can't do much for their ankle, right? I may say, hey, we're going to work on glute med strength. We'll work on quad strength, not because you need to, but because it will make it, there's a, there are risk factors and I can't do much with your ankle anyways. So we might as well do something beneficial for your leg for when you return to sport that you're not a risk to re-injure, but it's not as beneficial as the balance and proprioception. Like that's pretty clear in a lot of the studies. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So we've looked at, at this point, if we go back to physical exam, we've pretty much done our key findings, our ligament tests, our swelling, um, movement fault. You guys talked about gait deviations and lack of dorsiflexion being the primary one. Fantastic associated impairments. We looked at some strength of muscles. We looked at range of motion of dorsiflexion because that's a big risk factor for re-sprains. We've looked at balance assessments, star excursion, the best test. And we looked at hopping, mostly lateral hopping, right? These do not all need to be done on your eval. It depends on where they are at. If someone doesn't have good range of motion and they don't, and they have tons of swelling, I'm not even worried about hopping early on, right? Take care of Remember that pyramid, take care of all of the stuff on the bottom of the pyramid, range, swelling, and then move up, okay? Differential, right? We talked about peroneal nerve. We talked about cuboid. We talked about syndesmotic sprains. And someone fantastically brought up ankle fracture and the auto ankle rules. Great. So now it's in, if we move from this, right, ankle sprain, and we move to interventions, right? Manual therapy, what do you think we're going to do? If we're doing manual therapy, what are we doing it for? Out of everything we've talked about as far as impairments, what would we be end up treating? Soft tissue massage, compression, improved dorsiflexion range of motion, move that edema. Perfect, yep, so in the acute person, get the edema moving, get things out of there. Um, Yep, fantastic. How about later on? What would we do in maybe range of motion? Our, yeah, range of motion, or this is where we'd start doing our mobilization. So in the acute phase, right? You guys nailed it. Edema management. In the subacute phase, if it's a distal tib fib stiffness, talocrural stiffness, um, posterior glides dorsiflexion mobs with motion, so MWMs, inversion MWMs, right? There's some, some, there's some studies that show that when you have a lateral ankle sprain, sometimes instead of the ATFL being stretched, the ATFL pulls on the fibular head. And so really you get like this distal tib-fib capsule irritation. Um, and so then the idea is you're trying to move the fibular head more, right? So think this is not necessarily something you would do early on. Um, a lot of things, right? especially this one here, your telocrural distraction manipulation, right? Someone with an acute ankle sprains, maybe even subacute, isn't gonna enjoy 
in distraction. But if it's someone who's lacked dorsiflexion for a month, right, they haven't been able to get into 10 degrees of dorsiflexion for the last month, they're not having any pain or swelling with active range, hey, I'm totally fine on working on that joint manipulation. Again, just not early on. Okay, so that's manual therapy. So pretty easy. The only manual therapy we're really working on is to either improve swelling or to improve um, mobility. They did a, and there's a couple of low level studies, like not tons of high participants, but that showed good outcomes with taping, right? Uh, and the two that I'll talk about, one of them talked about um, if you ended up mobilizing someone's talocrural joint into a posterior glide, right? There's actually what's called a posterior tailor tilt, a tape, where you tape the, the talus relatively posterior and then you have them walk. And they had patients walk for 10 minutes with this tape on versus people that just had a sham tape and walk. And the group that walked with the tape on had a six degrees increase in dorsiflexion, right? So just from doing walking. So the nice thing is that can, be, that can, that can correlate to your home exercise program by taping them into like this, what's called an MWM tape. And then, hey, just go walk and that will give you more dorsiflexion. There's a similar tape for the distal tib fib where let's say someone went into plantar flexion or dorsiflexion and there was pain. And if you kind of give them a posterior tailor or posterior fibular mobilization in standing and it makes them feel better, there's a tape where you can pull the posterior tibia, or I'm sorry, the lateral fibular distal fib, um, lateral malleolus, sorry, you pull the lateral malleolus backwards. So it's, it's cool that it's something that can correlate exactly to what you're doing in the clinic. All right, so now if we move to Therax, right, if we're working on mobility, right, it kind of matches. We're improving dorsiflexion. If we need to improve plantar flexion, right, this would be the next step, right, besides active range of motion, they have no pain with active range. Let's have them do like a self overpressure. So they're going in quadruped and kind of rocking back to create a plantar flexion stretch. Majority of people after an ankle sprain cannot get here, right? right? She's at a full, I mean, she's at a full like 90 degrees of plantar flexion almost, right? So what would be, uh, what could you do? If someone can't handle this, what could you do to maybe make it a little less aggressive? Add a pillow? Yep, add a pillow or a towel roll underneath the anterior ankle. To dorsiflexion, good. And here's just some good dorsiflexion ones. All right, so that would be our mobility, right? We don't want to spend too much time there. Hopefully, their ankle mobility gets better pretty quickly, and we can move on to what's going to allow them to go back to sport and not re injure it, right? So, here, right, you have your strengthening. So, stuff we already talked about where you work on isometrics, you work on rhythmic stabilizations, and then you can progress to concentric, eccentric stuff, right? But again, there's studies that show the group that did this on table stuff versus the people that did functional stuff didn't have as good an outcome. So we may need to start on the table just to get them to kind of normal, but really we want to get them into functional as soon as possible, right? So Dr. Lamont, like, yes. we had two questions. Um, first one I'll start off with was, wouldn't you want to stretch them into dorsiflexion? Um, so maybe you are just when you're showing the quad rock back that they're that per that specific patient was just lacking would be lacking plantar flexion. That's why you would do it. Yeah. So, so a lack a lack of dorsiflexion is a risk factor to re-injure it. You're more likely to lose dorsiflexion. So you want to work on that. But you do want to norm think about it. they probably didn't plantar flex for a while fully because that kind of puts them in a stretch. So once the ligament is scarred down a little bit, once they're kind of not having pain, you want to normalize their range, right? We don't want to send someone out to their sport if they do lack plantar flexion because you need that for takeoff in your jump. You need that for a good push off. You should go into plantar flexion. So it's just normalizing. It's normalizing the impairment to say, hey, you have full ankle range, right? So, um, but you're right. That wouldn't be the primary. Dorsiflexion is much more of a problem than plantar flexion, but I want to make sure they're normal. Got it. And then kind of going off of that was that, at what point do you stop working on range of motion if that is not within normal limits and the interventions I choose, I, or I chose are not helping? Can I move on to working on stability? Or is you, are you working on it at, at the same time? I, I would say, um, oh, that's a good question. I'll give you the 
good answer. And I'll tell you the clinical, like how I really feel about it in the clinic. Um, so I'm going to work on dorsiflexion until I can get it to be normal to the other side or normal to what research says is normal, unless I've done three visits of it not changing. So if I've done three visits of it not changing, not changing, um, then again, there's no reason for me to keep working on it if it's not changing, right? However, I'd say the tough part about that is someone that's had an ankle sprain, do you think they've had an ankle sprain before? Probably, and a third ankle sprain for that. So a lot of people, once you have one, you have a lot. So if someone had an ankle sprain eight years ago and then four years ago and then two years ago, and now I'm seeing them for their current ankle sprain, they might not have had their normal dorsiflexion for the last eight years, right? If, if someone hasn't been able to get to 43 degrees of weight-bearing dorsiflexion for eight years, I'm probably not going to change that, right? So hard thing is we don't know that, right? We can't ask them, hey, did you ever get your full range of motion back? Most people say, yeah, I feel like I did. But unless they were a PT and they tested it, they, won't, they don't really know. Um, so that's a tough thing. So I say there's some times where I don't get it back to normal. And I kind of, and the person that has lots of ankle sprains, I can kind of, I can kind of have my thought about why that is, right? They probably weren't there in a long time, but I do always want to try. So I kind of, for my thing is it's, Hey, if it's three visits of not working on it, of not changing, I'll switch. The second part of your question is I am totally okay with working on two different things, right? Uh, meaning I'm going to work on my manual skills. I'll work on the mobility dorsiflexion, but I'm going to make sure I save time for their single limb stance balance. Right, uh, because I know that is the kind of the big thing going back that can help them long term to prevent ankle sprains. Um, plus, it's tough to spend a full thirty minutes just working on someone's ankle mobility. Ankle mobility. Um, I want to make sure I measure afterwards. So I'll do my knee to wall. I'll check a functional squat, see if it hurts, how much range. I'll treat it. I'll retest knee to wall, recheck squat, make sure it changed, and then we'll move on to the um, the, st the stability component of it. Right. Good. good good questions awesome dr lemoyne there is one more is there a guide on site for how to do the taping you mentioned um you know i don't know if let me go to interventions modalities ankle brace to no we don't have it in here on taping those are things that um i've kind of just read on my own that again i think i mentioned like they're not like these gigantic good studies that have tons of people it's smaller ones that just are more interesting I can give you guys references though and um, find them. Am I mentioning those taping, um, the, the names? Yeah. Um, One yeah. is a posterior Taylor Glide MWN tape for dorsiflexion. Posterior Taylor Glide. And the other one is a posterior, a posterior fibular malleoli, so lateral malleoli, um, posterior glide taping. And that one was more for plantar flexion. So someone who like goes on their push off phase of gait or they do a heel raise and it hurts when they do a heel raise, it hurts. You create a posterior glide and they redo it and it feels better. And they're both kind of MWM tapes. All right. So under motor coordination, we did the acute protective. Now we're under our loading, right? We have functional stuff like squatting. You can do side steps for like general strengthening but really we wanna get into those balance tests and those hopping tests. So these are no different than the test, right? The test that we did for assessment becomes our treatment. And as you guys so brilliantly stated, there are six, seven, eight ways to make this more specific to that person or to challenge them to make them work harder, right? So I think some people talked about adding balance pads, adding, um, uh, yelling at them, someone said, uh, Give them, throwing the ball at with them, put them in a sport. So yeah, um, there's one study I talked about just having people count backwards by seven. So just giving their brain something else to focus on makes their balance worse. So you can totally have them work on that stuff. But again, unless they're going into that, maybe you find something that's more specific to them. So that'd be our Therex. Functional movement, you guys already talked about gait training. So good job. And then modalities, which we talked about, right? Icing, bracing unloading and then if we need to some electrotherapy really which is really just to help the pumping mechanism right help get the kind of pump the fluid out right? which again those are only really early on um, or maybe you're in the subacute phase where you're working on some of these higher level things and then afterwards your ankle sore 
which is totally normal, right? It shouldn't be, you feel no pain at all the whole time. It's like, hey, you shouldn't feel acute pain while you're doing something, but after you train for a half hour, sure, your ankle might be sore. That's the person like, hey, make sure you ice for 20 minutes afterwards, right? Undo the negative that come along with the positive for training. Cool. Um, nice. All right. So next, very cool. Any uh, any questions, you guys, or any comments about kind of lateral ankle sprains? What do you guys think? Dr. Lemoyne, I have a question. Yes. Um, so you were talking about uh, incorporating like single imbalance, star excursion balance test, um, and I remember from class, uh, they're super important. When would you assess that? Because obviously they can never tolerate that initially mm. um, unless they're like a chronic. Um, would you just kind of wait till they could do a single limb maybe? Um, I would wait till they can do a single limb squat because they need to be able to squat down to do it. So okay. That, so they can do a double limb squat, totally fine. They do a, I mean, that may be something we look at in our eval, right? Hey, mm -hmm. let's start with some posture. Let's start with some functional stuff. Do a squat, no problem. Do a single limb squat. Eh, no, it doesn't really hurt. doesn't look as good. Boom, I'm going to do single limbs. I'm going to do star excursion with that person versus double limb squat hurts. All right, I'm not going to do star excursion today because it already hurts. Because this is a test that is more of not limited by pain. It's more like a functional test where, hey, they just don't have the stability or strength to reach as far, right? It shouldn't be something that, ouch, I stop because it hurts. If that's the case, it's, it's like doing a, it's like MMT in someone, hey, I'm going to check your strength and they don't push very hard because it hurts them. Is that really a true measure of their strength? Not really, right? Good question though. Good question. That makes sense. Yep. Let's see. Let's see. If I go to patient education, ankle foot, ankle sprains. So this is kind of the, some of the education things that can be emailed to patient, right? So um, under the patient education app, quick two to three minute read or video. And then it has some of the common early stuff, right? So working on just general stretching, general strengthening, general balance, right? So early on people that can't do much early on, right? We can always work on stuff on the table, right? Studies show that the glute med becomes insufficient. So that's something that you can send pretty easily. And then if we go to JOSPT. Right? Dr. Lemoyne, can you just show how uh, they can send it to their patients um, yep. in clinic? Yeah, so physio U, patient education. We are under ankle foot. So ankle sprains, right? First one up, right? There's a little picture of an email, you just click it, right? And it just kind of, whatever is attached to your account, it sends it up and then you just type in Joe Schmo or whatever the email address is. Good. Um, and then JOSPT, because this is so common, right? JOSPT has one as well for ankle sprains. Or if you click on it, it shows they have one as well that they've written that you can email to your patients as well. And they're, it's free. Like JSP doesn't charge anything for these. All right. So that would be our kind of using the patient education. If special tests, you don't want to go down the whole entire pattern right, ankle foot, you can just look at ligament sprains and it tells you, right, oh, those are the tests I wanna work on and watch those videos and stuff, so. All right, so ankle sprains is kinda in a couple of them. Good, all right, so if I go back to this one, all right, good. So again, these are all of the, oops, these are all of kind of those guidelines that we talked about that what are what the evidence suggests from that um, CPG, right? And then lastly was next week, right? So next week, same time, nine o'clock, except now we're moving on from ankle to low back, right? And so we'll start with kind of the easiest one. We'll start with mobility and we'll move on to coordination and then leg pain stuff. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, any other questions that you guys might have or, yeah, anyway. Otherwise, thank you guys so much for joining and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you.